Um, I'm Naomi Mezzi. I'm a, a faculty member at the Law Center, and I want to just give a brief welcome and introduction on behalf of the Gender Justice Steering Committee. The the before I introduce the steering committee, I want to just say we this is our third annual faculty research colloquium. In some ways, this is how we started before we were even a thing, was pulling together faculty from different campuses, different disciplines and departments, and thinking together about questions not just of gender, but of gender in all different forms of gender and how gender intersects with all the other ways in which people go about living their lives, how it intersects with race and sexuality. Um, ethnicity and um, class, so many different um, identities, but also forms of subordination. And that's why we ended up using the plus in our name, was we wanted to keep it focused on gender, but we also, it was really important to us that gender was um, conceived of intersection, intersectionally. And when we began three years ago, this is the first year we've even had a budget so this is and and even that is pretty uh, a scrappy one so this is in some ways like a organization that has existed by dint of dedication conviction and deep intellectual engagement on the part of Georgetown faculty from and students actually from all uh, campuses and it began with a number of conversations at the different campuses and we came together as a steering committee and I want to thank the steering committee because while um, I and Christy Graves are this semester's faculty co-directors, this is uh, Deborah Epstein and Dion um, Coker Appia will be the faculty directors next semester and it's a where we really do operate as a steering committee. So I want to introduce both Deborah and Dion, um, Nan Hunter from the law school, Christy Graves, who will be coming um, momentarily, Lisa Krim, who will also be here soon, and myself. Denise Brennan from the anthropology department is um, normally a part of our steering committee, and she's on leave this year, and she'll be back next. I also really want to thank the, the students who give us their time and energy to make help us make gift bags and haul tables around and all of the things that it takes to get an event off the ground, um, print programs. So Rachel Farkas and Elena Orbach from the Law Center and then Allie Frey from the college have been really helpful to us this semester. Um, I want to just say a special thanks to Deborah Epstein for organizing the colloquium from from really from beginning to end and it's uh as in everything we do it's a labor of love before we get started i thought i would just show you on the back of the program it's a little schematic that we put together at a retreat last spring if you, you have to have really good eyes to see, <laughs> to see it take out your monocle now and, um, <laughs> um, but what it does is it tries to capture what we as the Gender Justice Initiative want to capture, which is interdisciplinary work in an academic environment that begins by just inspiring questions, inspiring questions about problems in the world, um, conflicts among ideas, conflicts among theories, um, questions that inspire more questions, research, dialogue, deeper understanding, and engagement with each other, and then mobilizing that into action, and mobilizing that into action by engaging with activists in the community, by thinking about who in around the city and around the country are doing work that resonates with um, what we want to actualize in the world. And then the last piece is just making a lot of the structural inequalities more visible. And we think that this happens through that process, um, through asking questions, 
through engaging with other people and then bringing those thoughts, ideas, and commitments into the world. I'm going to stop there and introduce, who's our moderator for the first, are you are? Um, thank you so much, Deborah, for pulling this together. Is that your phone? Yes. Okay. So I'm going to ask the folks who are presenting on our first panel to come up and hopefully you have a name tent or something, maybe not. Um, oh, whoops. Okay, maybe we'll take. We could just pass it. Can we just yeah, pass can it? we just pass the mic? Is that doable? Awesome. This is our most crowded panel, so we have a little bit of seat overflow. You guys are really gonna get to know each other. <laughs> okay, so, <laughs> so this is a panel on the Me Too movement and the workplace, and we have um, a number of panelists. Um, at the far end of the table, we have Lisa Singh from the Computer Science Department, Jamila Williams and Naomi Mezzi from the Law School, and they are gonna be speaking, each of them, a little bit on a project they've been working on together about Me Too converting conversation into change. Um, and then we have Lane Windham from the Kalmanovitz Institute for Labor and the Working Poor at the college, who's going to be talking about Me Too's, the Me Too movement's hidden roots. And then we have Chris Ticcioni, who's at the Law School, uh, who's going to be speaking about gender degradation and how legal structures perpetuate occupational segregation and gender disparities. I'm going to keep time from the front, um, so somewhat loosely, <laughs> and then at the end I'll come up and moderate some question and answer, okay? So, do you guys want to... It's right here, and it's really, it's the greenest forward. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, so I am really excited about this collaboration. Um, one of the sort of goals of the Gender Justice Initiative is to promote and facilitate collaborative and interdisciplinary research. And so we were really thrilled when Lisa Singh from the Computer Science Department and the Massive Data Institute came to us last year and said, hey, I've been collecting all of the Me Too tweets since the beginning. Do you have some people who might wanna work on this, You know, use the data in different ways? And we were like, we'll find some. <laughs> um, and so we, the, Jamila and Lisa and I have been working together. My own caveat is I've sort of been tagging along. I'm not a data person. I find the data really interesting and meaningful, but I really come to this project as a legal and a cultural scholar. And I'm interested in the relationship between individual injury and group inequality. And, I, and so one of the reasons I wanna be thinking with more data is to try and help make those connections. So I just want to begin with some cultural context about the pervasiveness of uh, sexual misconduct. I need the little. Right. <clears throat> um, oops. And um, much of this data will be familiar to you, and it really is just laying the groundwork. How many, um, and I'm going to use the word women, although Obviously, some men and, and some, some gender nonconforming folks experience um, uh, high degrees of sexual harassment, but I'm, we're really focused um, particularly on women as the predominant um, recipients of uh, harassment and misconduct. The, the, if you take it at its broadest, which usually is articulated as harassment, it's an overwhelming number, 81%, and it comes up in so many different contexts. The, once you think about the types of harassment and misconduct that women are experiencing, 
the you can it it helps create a little bit of nuance between whether it's verbal sexual harassment which is overwhelmingly common um, to f different forms of uh, physical aggression cyber harassment is 41 percent and then sexual assault uh, 27 percent and we're beginning with this sort of pervasiveness of the problem to think about how Me Too emerges. But not only Me Too, partly Me Too emerges against the backdrop of a whole social media um, form of activism itself. And it's create, social media has created new ways of thinking about um, aggregating information collectivizing experiences of injury, injustice, and mobilizing for change. And many users find um, courage in that, that idea of anonymity and collective action at the same time. So you can see from some of the biggest forms of uh, Twitter activism, the kinds of things that people focus on. The most enduring Twitter activism has been the Black Lives Matter movement. And um, Me Too follows closely behind in the amount of attention and the number of tweets it has inspired. And the result is that the scale of disclosure by Me Too tweets alone is really the tip of the iceberg. And here I just want to sort of try to layer on what we think the data is th telling us at the deepest levels. Um, so. The data at the tip tells us something about how pervasive different forms of sexual harassment are in the lived experiences of women. So obviously the people who tweet on Me Too or post on Facebook is gonna be very few compared to the number who are experiencing those forms of harassment um, in their lives. And then the last link is if you think about the expansiveness of sexual harassment and the pervasiveness of sexual harassment, the way that it helps us think about structural inequality, that deepest part of the iceberg, is that it is through tolerated harassment and violence that we create inequality, right? It's when we allow socially, legally, all of that lived experience to be hard to report, um, dangerous to report, not enforced, all of that creates a power imbalance between those who harass and those who are harassed, uh, those who assault, those who are assaulted in much the same way that we have seen in the Black Lives Matter um, movement and racial violence as well. And it helps make certain kinds of inequalities then between men and women, um, black people and white people seem more natural in the world because that's just the way things are. It happens so much, we do so little about it that it creates the, the uh, kind of the inequality that seems normal that almost seems normal, I should say, because part of this effort of highlighting the data is to make it more visible. Okay, so um, my role here today is to um, give you some insight into what is what the online conversation um, contains and uh, so let's get started this is going to be a whirlwind what I can do in five minutes or seven you know five to seven minutes it's going to be fast so I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about methods and some of the other parts that are really interesting but I encourage you to talk to me afterwards because I would love to talk more about those I'm a computer scientist so by my nature I love to talk about those things okay so the movement the movement actually started in 2007 um, when uh, Tarana Burke, uh, she dis she's a, um, an activist and she wanted to make people more aware about sexual abuse and harassment. But it really wasn't until um, October uh, when all the allegations came out against Harvey Weinstein 
uh, that the explosion kind of started. So if we look at it in a little bit more detail, uh, October 5th was when Ashley Judd accused Harvey Weinstein of sexual assault. And even that wasn't when the movement really, really uh, exploded. It was actually October 15th. And this one tweet really changed the Me Too movement. The one tweet, um, if you've been sexually harassed or assaulted, um, my eyes are not so good, write <laughs> Me Too as a reply to this tweet, okay? And that was huge, and I think one of the key things to note there is uh, there's two lines there. One is for tweets and one is for retweets. So there were over a million individuals um, or groups that responded right away uh, to, that, to that call. Since October 2017, the Me Too movement has been used over 19 million times um, by over 3 million people and groups. So what are people actually talking about? Um, and there's a lot they're talking about. We're only starting to look at the descriptives of what they're talking about here today. Um, and this will give us insight into connecting these descriptives to things that are happening in the world. Um, OK, so one key point is that in order for a movement to continue there have to be activities and events that are keeping it alive and what we've seen with the me too movement is that the conversation is really driven by many different social and political events so if we look from october to um to the middle of the summer what we notice here is that uh there are events that continually occur. Some of them are positive and some of them are negative. And actually, I'm noticing this is backward. Oh, oh, you know what? No animation. Oh, 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 okay, okay, okay. Um, so, you're going to see half my slides because they don't animate. It's okay. It's all right. Um, so, this is not the whole thing. You can see underneath <laughs> the slide, there's, there's another slide that shows you a very small, um, shows you the, um, the events that occurred in the previous year. This is just focusing on the last couple of months. And in fact, what you'll notice, um, it might be hard to see given that the animation's not working, is that there has been a large increase in the usage of the Me Too hashtag in the last two months. In the previous year, it was between uh, um, about 20,000 to 150,000 Me Tweet um, uh, Twitter um, posts per day. And now we're getting at this stage where we're having hundreds of thousands regularly. Um, and the bottom is above 100,000. OK, so, um, so it's really important to understand that this conversation is driven by these types of events. Um, but we wanted to look at it in a little bit more detail to understand the types of topics that people might be talking about on the Me Too move, um, on this channel, on the stream of data. Um, and so a good proxy for topics is hashtags. Uh, it can give us a, a nice uh, coarse look at the types of topics people are talking about. And, um, and so if we look at this particular uh, grouping, um, we have a number of different topics. The colors tell us what the topic is. The size of the bubbles tell us how many people use that particular hashtag in conjunction with the Me Too hashtag. Um, and so there's two takeaways from this. The first takeaway is that there, people are talking about a lot of topics. Um, there are a lot of different types of discussions, which is really important to keep a movement alive and active. But the second takeaway, which would have been my dramatic showing with the circle coming up, but you can already see the circle here, is activism. Um, activism is the largest component of the movement to date. People are um, interested in, um, in engaging uh, about this topic. Okay. And uh, we'll talk more about that later. Okay. So, so uh, topics are important, but so are the words people use. Um, and sadly, these would all come up at different times, so it's not going to do what, what, what we wanted to do. But if you look at the largest of these particular words, these words have occurred over a million times in over a million tweets. And these are words like women, which is a support word, movement, which is an activism word, 
sexual, sexual, which is an experience word. So we can see these different types of topics even in these words. But we also see how many, how many uh, words there are related to misconduct and rape, victims, abuse, assault. These are other words that are being shared, which means that people are sharing their experiences online. And it gives us insight into the fact that people want to share their experiences online as well. Um, and so thinking about this, we started thinking about, well, we, we were curious whether or not these mapped to different types of occupations. Uh, are they just sharing experiences that they have outside the workplace, or are there some experiences that are being shared that are within the workplace? Um, so we took a list, we looked at the list of the, um, the Department of Labor list of occupations, and we looked at those occupations and simplified variants of those occupations that might be online uh, to see whether or not any of those were appearing online on the Me Too movement um, thread. And um, here what we've done is we've identified the top ones, but over 100 occupations uh, were mentioned um, on this stream uh, by over 250 different individuals. Um, this particular categorization is interesting because what it shows us are the ones that were mentioned most frequently uh, if they're bolded, that means they were mentioned over 20,000 times. Um, otherwise, they were mentioned at least 5,000 times. But the ordering is based upon um, this average salary of these different occupations. And so what you see here are two things. You see that there's a lot of uh, discussion around um, occupations that are um, that have a higher average salary, but, th and, but there is still discussion about occupations that are at the lower salary as well. And, uh, and I think one of the key things to note here is this is just discussion. It doesn't mean that these are the individuals who have experience. So judge is very prominent, but that has a lot to do with Kavanaugh, right? And so we know that as well. Um, and uh, if we divide these occupations into um, their gender, uh, whether they're more male dominated um, or mixed or female dominated, we see that the majority of occupations that are discussed are more male dominated. We then did one other analysis. We decided to see how, um, who, whether or not these were related, these occupations were related to people who were sharing their experiences, or were they sharing experiences without mentioning occupations. So we took a sample of 200,000 individuals that, um, that are sharing their experiences online or talking about an experience that's being shared online. And we looked at the occupations of those particular that those particular individuals mentioned. Um, over 100 occupations were mentioned by those different individuals, so it was a large number, even if they were only mentioned a few times. But what was interesting to find there is that the dominant occupation in that particular case that was mentioned approximately 20% of the time um, was teachers. So um, in looking at those, what we're seeing is that a lot of people are talking about teachers when they're talking about either their own experience or experiences that they're talking about online. And I'm going to go ahead and um, stop there. And um, we, did I go the wrong way? Yes, I did. Um, and I'm just going to pause here and mention that uh, we also did a tone analysis, which just looks at whether people are, um, are, are speaking in a positive tone about experiences, activism, whatever it may be, or in a negative tone. I'm just going to leave this here, which just to show you that a lot of the, uh, the feeling and discussions online have a negative tone, which isn't surprising. Uh, given the fact that people are, are sharing um, difficult experiences or sharing concerns that they have. Okay, so that is um, a great overview of the types of conversations taking place, the nature and some of the content. What I'm going to do now is 
take a step forward and think about whether these conversations are promoting broader changes. So broader social, legal, and political changes. To what extent are these changes happening? And whether they seem like shorter term changes or whether we'll see longer term sustainable change here. Some of that is still a question to be answered, but I'll introduce um, some of the preliminary research on this. So first, let's look at whether law is even a part of the conversation, picking up from where Lisa left off. So here we compiled a list of legal words just to look at how much and how frequently these came up in these tweets with the hashtag me too. So here we see that um, these legal terms you see pictured are, are mentioned in at least 15,000 tweets. The most prevalent terms are harassing, um, court, hearing, claim, um, mentions of reporting, so here you see that, that talking about legal activity is, is part of this social media activism in addition to people just generally sharing their experiences or, or support. So when we think about the, the change, I'm gonna start with just a few different ways that we're seeing legal changes. So first, I'll start with Time's Up Legal Fund. So here, um, Lisa showed the, the, tw um, the different topics. So the, the Time's Up hashtag is the most frequently occurring hashtag. Time's Up Legal Defense Fund is a, is a fund of um, created by those in Hollywood, so mainly celebrities, that are to help individuals bring legal claims um, against primarily sexual harassment. And there's been a lot of talk about the movement being primarily geared to affluent women, towards white women, towards Hollywood. So here, they sort of came up with this fund, $22 million to date, to specifically help lower income women, women of color, and other vulnerable populations. So they've done over 3,500 um, claims, or at least provided some type of support for them in all 50 states at this point. So that's one way that we've seen a broader change spark from this initial Twitter activity. Also, I wanted to take a look at how much people are reporting through the formal cha cha um, channel. So here, this is the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. This is where individuals have to go, at least for workplace harassment, before they can take their claim into court. Um, and as you see here, we see a spike in 2018 beyond the prior year. So there's been this decline of individuals bringing their, their charges in, not necessarily a decline in harassment, but people have been less likely to report, but then that's gone back up, the first increase this decade in terms of charges going to the EEOC. The EEOC has also used this momentum to bring more cases. So they've, they've brought 41 lawsuits against employers. They usually take a very small fraction of lawsuits, um, those that are seem more l larger and systemic. So they're taking more lawsuits. They've already recovered $70 million, which is more than the $47 million in the previous year. They're doing way more harassment trainings because all of the activity on their website related to harassment is, is pretty much exploding at this point. So people are going on there, in, um, victims as well as employers, to figure out how to use this and how to, employers potentially, to how to come, come into compliance better. Next, legislative reform. So all the legal activity, the Time's Up Legal Fund and the EEOC charges are all good. However, it doesn't help much if our harassment laws are weak, which they are. So federal protection excludes many workers. Um, so domestic workers, farm workers, independent contractors, so those are freelancers or those working in the gig economy, um, those working for smaller employers. So if you work for an employer of, for, of less than 15 employees, then you aren't covered by law. So here we have 22 bills introduced related to um, gender equity and harassment more specifically in Congress, 281 in state legislature. So here you see the state activity hoping to expand what we see at the federal level. So that is promising, but more of these laws that are introduced need to actually be passed and adopted. Quickly, another thing, so we also need to think about who our government officials are, who our policymakers are. There's been a large spike in allegations against those very lawmakers who are responsible for whether these different legislative reforms are passed. 
So here I just show that after the um, October 2017 tweets, we see these spikes, they've dropped off some, but there's still lots of activity there. And 75% of those who were accused are actually no longer in office anymore. So not only are people saying me too and coming forward to challenge these more powerful, um, primarily men, all but three of these 138 were men, um, they're also actually leading to changes in our political structure by coming forward. So Kavanaugh was a little bit discouraging for some on this to say, okay, well, there's going to be retaliation and it won't help if you come forward. But many, for many of these, it actually has created change. So here, just a few things in terms of how we can um, move forward. There are mandatory arbitration agreements that keep these claims out of court. There are non-disclosure agreements that keep victim silence. Um, we have our, our representation is still um, predominantly male, which can breed a culture, um, toxic cultures in some cases. Um, we have all these people who aren't covered, so we need to think about those reforms. And even broad, more broadly, so I'm talking about law, but more broadly, employers can change their policies and culture. So we just saw the Google walkout, and that resulted in them now no longer using these mandatory arbitration agreements that keep victims out of court. So in addition to the official laws on the books, employers can also take steps to, to remedy um, some of these issues. Other than that, just speaking up, um, men, particularly all the burden should not be on women to speak up about these issues and only on the victims, so bystanders as well. Um, also changing beliefs, attitudes, behaviors by changing our socialization, both young and those older, talking about the language around this, talking about gender equity and encouraging people to challenge some of these structures that have been so problematic. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Lane Windham, and I'm with the Kalmanovitz Initiative for Labor and the Working Poor. Um, I'm also a labor historian. Uh, my PhD is in US history, so I'm going to uh, take us into having a historical discussion today. I'm going to start with the premise that Me Too is both a gender justice and a labor justice issue. We don't often start this conversation with labor, per se, but think about it. The epicenter of much of women's outrage um, has been about sexual harassment and assault uh, has been at the workplace, right? The, from uh, the, Holly, the nation's Hollywood studios to the agricultural fields, from restaurant kitchens to the newsrooms. A lot of the outrage has been about mostly men using their power over women's paychecks to have power over their bodies. Today, I'm going to argue that today's Me Too movement has hidden roots in a forgotten struggle over workplace equity that women waged in the 1970s and early 1980s, just as millions of women were entering the nation's workplaces for the first time. The resistance to that workplace feminism ultimately limited the movement's reach, and it's a resistance that included employer lawbreaking and even union busting. As a result, today's Me Too movement must organize absent the kinds of strong workplace-based uh, movements and organizations once envisioned by labor feminists. Okay, so I'm gonna talk mostly about the 70s, but we have to start this discussion with the 1964 Civil Rights Act, Title VII, opened up a whole new employment opportunities to women, right? Banning uh, workplace discrimination according to sex, race, ethnicity, religion. And women really rushed through this newly opened door. A whopping 12 million more women worked for wages by the close of the 1970s. Their rate of workplace participation doubled compared to the 1960s. 1978 marked the first year that a majority of US women worked for wages. Now I should note here that this was a new situation for many white women, but a more familiar one for women of color who had long worked for wages. Okay, well, what would be the new terms that would govern America's workplaces now that there was this influx of women? 
a generation of labor feminists led a wave of organizing, and they deeply contested the new terms of America's workplaces. They did that in a number of ways, including by organizing unions, forming workers' associations, and by naming and exposing what came to be known as sexual harassment. So one of the hallmarks of this workplace struggle was that it was cross-class, uniting middle-class and working-class women. Now this is important, I think, because uh, there are issues today about uh, a cross-class alliance as, as part of today's Me Too movement. So take, for example, the Boston-based association 9 to 5, which is one of the most well-known of the employment-based women's organization that organizations that burst onto the scene in the 1970s. It united college-educated women who were justifiably bitter that they were stuck as low-level secretaries or editorial assistants in Boston's publishing houses despite having a college degree. It united them with working-class women who typed, filed, and filled bosses' coffee cups in Boston's uh, banks and insurance companies. And the women of 9 to 5 demanded better wages, respect, clear job descriptions, and an end to what b later became labeled as sexual harassment on the job. Now, humor was often their weapon of choice. For instance, they ran a petty office procedure contest. One of the winners was the boss who required his secretary to sew up his pants while he was wearing them. The women marched on his office and in front of news cameras, you see here, they presented him with an executive sewing kit. <laughs> So they weren't, they weren't using, well, they were starting to, in 1977, starting to use the term sexual harassment, but you can see that they are, they're taking it on. They're taking the issue on, right? So the first group to use the term sexual harassment was another workplace-based women's organization called Working Women United in Ithaca, New York. It was inspired by the case of Carmita Wood, an administrative assistant harassed by a Cornell University professor in the um, nuclear studies laboratory. She sought help from the women's branch of the Cornell's human affairs program, and they formed uh, Working Women United. Now, they debated what to call this. Should they call it sexual coercion, sexual intimidation, and they went with sexual harassment, and in 1975 held a speak out, naming that abuse. Um, and then 40 women launched this, this group, and it too was a cross-class alliance. It included middle-class women from Cornell and working-class women from local factories in Ithaca. Well, Working Women United moved to New York City in the late 70s and became part of a larger national dialogue on workplace sexual harassment. Uh, the group in 1977 organized a speak out sponsored by Ms. Magazine, which also did this cover story uh, in November of 1977, which was considered brown groundbreaking. Uh, and the issue soon got picked up in the national press by the New York Times, Good Morning America, the Phil Donahue Show. Okay, so just as you've got this massive influx of women coming into the nation's workforces, women made a full-throated demand for equity, for safe working conditions, and they also sought to improve their jobs by forming labor unions. Union organizing was part of this workplace feminism in this wave in the 70s and 80s. Though historians and journalists often describe the 1970s as a time of weakening unions and working class apathy, the 1970s actually saw a massive wave of private sector union organizing that was driven by the women and people of color who had gained new access to the job market following the Civil Rights Act. This wave is the subject of my recent book, Knocking on Labor's Door, and I studied data from the National Labor Relations Board uh, elections. But I didn't do what most experts do and just look at who, how many people voted yes or how many wins there were. I actually counted all the workers voting in union elections whether they won or not. And what I found was that about half a million workers a year um, were voting in union elections in the 70s, the same pace as in the 50s and 60s. And that's what you're looking at here is sort of that middle section. And women were increasingly voting in union elections. While the labor board election data doesn't capture gender, 
I did a sectoral analysis of the elections, and it turns out there was an increasing number of union elections in women-dominated sectors, like service and retail, in the 1970s. So secretaries, flight attendants, retail clerks, nurses, waitresses, all powered a massive union organizing effort. In 1960, only 18% of union members were women. By 1984, that figure was 34%. Okay, so it's important to note that unions often have a fraught relationship to sexual harassment because their duty of fair representation requires them to defend workers accused of sexual harassment even when another union member makes the allegation. Women union members, however, did not let this issue stop them. They demanded that their unions make sexual harassment and discrimination a top priority. The Association of Flight Attendants, for example, broke away from its male-dominated parent union, the Airline Pilots Association, in 1974. They used picketing, EEOC charges, and their union contracts to beat back weight requirements for flight attendants, bans on pregnant flight attendants. When Continental Airlines launched its ad campaign, We Really Move Our Tails For You, the union launched its own campaign called Move Your Tails For Somebody Else. <laughs> In 1980, unions like the United Food and Commercial Workers Union were educating members, urging that, quote, all members have union protection against the gross violating of human and worker rights. Uh, other unions were involved in this, too. In 1979, the United Auto Workers won specific clauses on sexual harassment in their union contracts with Chrysler and Ford. Okay, so if there's so much activism among uh, workplace feminists, then why are women still fighting this battle today? Why are, why are women in the position they're in today, right? With where there the, has to be the Me Too movement. Well, the common answer that many historians give is that the backlash to feminism rolled back women's gains, such as by blocking the Equal Rights Amendment's passage. This narrative goes that uh, a rising right wing, religious right, pushed uh, a pro-life moral majority issues and so countered feminism. And much of this, for instance, was led by Phyllis Schlafly, who led the Stop ERA campaign. However, employer resistance to labor feminists was also key and de deserves a place in this narrative, uh, not to supplant the other, but to add to it. In addition to the right-wing political and cultural backlash, there was also a conservative corporate backlash that targeted women's labor activism, including unionization, and so weakened women's ability to effectively engage in workplace collective action. Employers ramped up their resistance to union organizing in the 1970s, just as women were entering the workforce en masse. So uh, what you're looking at here is a chart of unfair labor practice charges, which is like uh, employer law breaking from 1950 to 1990. Uh, you'll see a big rise there in the middle in the 1970s. Uh, the, in the 1970s, the number of unfair labor practice charges filed against employers doubled. This law breaking was effective. While workers won roughly 80% of their union elections in the 1940s, by the late 1970s, they won less than half. Employers began to rely much more heavily on union busters through an avalanche of trainings, seminars, and by going to work sites to train supervisors to fight unions, they made normal a level of anti-unionism that was considered extreme in the mid-century. They bred fear about new levels of women and people of color in the workforce and used this, work, this diverse workforce to gin up business. So for instance, John Kilgore, a union avoidance expert, wrote that, quote, all indications are that women are now more inclined to vote union than men. The potential combination of third party representation and real and imagined sexual discrimination, sexual harassment, and the demand for equal pay for comparable work could be rather explosive. And this is all in an article designed to teach people how to weaken unions uh, specifically at the office. So in the face of such employer resistance, the 1970s uh, workplace feminism activism never reached its full potential. By the early 1980s, far fewer workers tried to form unions, while half a million a year had tried to form unions in the 1970s. By 1982, you see that big dip. The number was down to 165,000, and it never again went above a quarter of a million. 
Um, so the result is that women in today's Me Too movement have had to take on sexual harassment absent a robust union presence and without the kinds of strong workplace organizations that they had once envisioned in the 1970s. The Me Too movement essentially is having to invent or reinvent its own organizing structures. It's interesting to me though that the Me Too movement in some ways not all the, in all ways, but in some ways is hearkening back to the cross-class coalitions of the 70s. When Hollywood stars began to raise sexual harassment, women farm workers reached out to them and talked about their shared plight. So you saw uh, solidarity on the red carpet at the Golden Globes as the stars brought workplace activists to join them, like those pictured here. Um, and in many ways, it's uh, also becoming a movement that cuts across class. Um, we just saw a great presentation, which I'm very interested in, in terms of what uh, folks are tweeting on, the kinds of occupations. We also learned about the huge number of spike and charges at the EEOC in uh, 2018. An analysis by the Center for American Progress, which I think looks at the EEOC charges over time, has found that uh, the most likely to file these charges aren't actresses or lawyers, they are waitresses and retail clerks, right? So they uh, are experiencing a lot of, of harassment and are, and are filing charges. So the Me Too movement has its roots, not only in feminism, but an unseen workplace and labor-based feminism that brought women together across class boundaries. I think the question today is to what extent women will be able to turn this generation's solidarity into a lasting and inclusive movement that can then win enduring workplace transformation. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm going to try to advance to my slides. Perfect. Um, so I'm Chris T. Shoney, and I'm also at the Law Center. Um, I, I was a little worried that my remarks were going to seem somewhat unrelated to the panel, but uh, Lane in particular has teed me up uh, beautifully, so I appreciate that. Uh, and I, too, start with the Me Too movement. Uh, when Dr. Ford's allegations against Justice Kavanaugh disrupted his confirmation process, critics blamed the Me Too movement. As a woman, lawyer, and law professor, I credited it. When his supporters uh, celebrated his ultimate confirmation as a victory on the merits, I experienced that as an abusive process that had avoided reaching a decision on the merits. What I'm talking about today is an abusive process that persists in all forms of gender discrimination in the workplace, and that is, for me, what this was. This was a national job interview where traditional male voices, values, attitudes, and behaviors both dominated and were rewarded, and traditionally female voices, values, attitudes, and behaviors were silenced and diminished. So I'm working on an article that looks at gender discrimination a little more broadly. And what I've done here is compiled uh, just a, a basic chart. It reads column left to the, to the right column. This is taken from the US Bureau of Labor Statistics report on hundreds of occupations. I pulled out just a few to be representative. And what you can see here is, uh, I start with on the top there, engineers, that we was civil engineers, I left that out just for space. Then management or business executives on down the line. What you can see uh, fairly clearly is that as the status and accompanying compensation for those occupations decreases, the percentage of women in that occupation increases. What's interesting to note here is that as the um, majority of women begin to dominate a profession, 
you can see that the nature of that profession is essentially a service position or a position that might traditionally be gendered as women's work. Here again is a chart, the same occupations. And what I've done is I've illustrated the gender pay gap. Now the gender pay gap in the US is roughly about 80%, um, but it actually varies quite a bit by occupation. And you can see here that what I've done is I've taken the 80%, uh, which by the way is um, not expected to close until 2106. And, um, and um, equal pay day this year was April 10, which means that in, on April 10 of 2018, a woman had earned what her male counterpart had earned at the end of calendar year 2017. So here you see, for example, for every male dollar earned, a female engineer would earn 88 cents and, and so on. There's quite a bit of variability. You see financial advisor, the guy or the woman you call up to tell you how to invest your money. Um, a woman makes about 59 cents in that job where a man makes a dollar. Um, the other thing to notice is that as the status and compensation of the occupation decreases, the gender gap decreases. Uh, so that in the profession most dominated by women, which is nursing, a woman is earning 91 cents to a male nurse's dollar, even though there are more women in that job by far, uh, by 11, it's 89 percent women uh, than men. There are two occupations where women earn more than men. Are you ready? Cafeteria attendant and wholesale and retail buyer excluding farm products. Um, so that's where we're shining. Um, if we zoom in on any occupation, and I've chosen my own because it's my own backyard and I know it best, uh, which is law faculty, you see a very similar story. And I would imagine you'd see this in a lot of uh, different ways. So what I've got here is a category of faculty kind of by status and security of position um, as uh, sort of legislated by our crediting association, which of course is the ABA. And you can see that as uh, the status and compensation of the occupation decreases, the percentage of women in that occupation de uh, increases dramatically. As far as gender pay gap goes, it's a slightly different story. So if you look at what I've got there is um, on the male column, the differential between what a male tenured faculty member would earn uh, versus what contract often uh, clinical faculty earn versus what sort of other skills or uh, writing faculty earn. And again, this is according to our ABA uh, calculations. What you'll notice is then I just took the 80% to show you what a woman would be earning in that, in that position. And what's ironic in this situation is that as the status and compensation decrease, the gender gap doesn't decrease, it actually increases and it increases dramatically. So you have faculty teaching the same students, often with the same education, earning that disparate um, compensation. So very much like Lane, um, my question is, uh, why are we still in this position today? How does this persist? And it echoes back to what Naomi gave us, which was there are these individual injuries but large groups of structural inequality. And it is to some extent the toleration of these things that allows them to persist. So there are uh, many theories out there about how this persists. Uh, of course, implicit bias against women, uh, just sort of generally. Kate Mann has a new book out. Uh, it's called, called Down Girl. I highly recommend it. It's called The Logic of Misogyny. She talks about misogyny not as hatred of women in particular, but just an enforcement mechanism for any patriarchy. Uh, there's also other theories in terms of lack of female mentors uh, and the continual struggle that women have to achieve life-work balance. My interest, though, is more in how the law participates in and perpetuates this process. Or put another way, how does the law prevent 
women from gaining gender, in a, gender equality in the workplace. Um, as Jamila pointed out, the law precludes uh, many potential plaintiffs, and it certainly has not proved to be a good enforcement mechanism for the federal and state laws we have that in theory prevent this from happening. Um, I think that, as Lane suggested, our laws are based on a 70s notion that equal access will result in equality. And I think we, we have seen that not to be the case. But what I think we need to focus on, and really where I'm, where I'm going in my own work, is, is trying to name what happens to women in the workplace under these circumstances. So we don't have a name right now for what happens to women in terms of their harm. What happens to women already earning less than their male counterparts who are belittled, demeaned, passed over, excluded, diminished, mansplained, man-terrupted, reappropriated, day after day and year after year? What does that mean for the women in our workplace? And so we know from Catherine McKinnon, and this, again, getting back to sexual harassment, we know how important it is to have a name to bring something into being or to consciousness. And uh, until we had the phrase, which I've now learned was coined in 75, um, we really just thought of that behavior as something men do. But when we had a phrase, we had something to fight against. Um, so what I'm trying to do is come up with a phrase to name the harm that women experience. And the phrase that I've been working with, I've published a little bit about it, is gender degradation. And I've defined it as behavior, I have to read it off the slide, uh, behavior based on the false belief that women, often with equal education and training or in service positions, are intellectually inferior to and less capable than men, which causes tangible and intangible harm. What I like about this phrase is that it focuses or shifts the focus of law and inequality to the victim. It ceases to think of inequality in the workplace as a cultural phenomenon or as something that the employer or the, um, the workforce does and it puts the focus on plaintiffs. It also captures the harm that women experience, which is physical and economic and psychic and emotional. When Catherine McKinnon was arguing to make sexual harassment a cause of action under our Title VII, she argued uh, how important it was to have a name for that activity. And she said, the unnamed should not be mistaken for the non-existent. Silence, she said, often speaks of pain and degradation so thorough that the situation cannot be conceived as other than it is. Quoting Sheila Robotham, who's a, a famous British feminist, she continued, when the conception of change is beyond the limits of the possible, there are no words to articulate discontent, so it is sometimes held not to exist. The sound of silence breaking makes us understand what we could not hear before. So what I'm hoping to do in the first of a series of articles is to break the silence, hear the sound of silence breaking, bring gender degradation into being, and give us something to fight against. Thank you. of applause for the whole panel. Thank you all so much. And we have a little, I have a new phone that I don't know how to use. So sorry, oh, here we go. So we have about 10 minutes to do question and answer. And so I'll try to call on people and you can identify who your question is put to or the whole panel. And I'll ask every, anybody who's speaking to speak up so everybody in the room can hear. Or we have a mic. Anyone? Yeah, go ahead. 
Hello, thank you guys so much for this wonderfully enlightening panel. My question is a little bit to Lane, but I think um, many of you could answer. Um, and it has to do with the ERA and the latest movements coming from Justice Kavanaugh and really how the Women's Mo March is now really focused on bringing this back, um, particularly considering that we have a lot more happening at the state levels um, than the federal levels especially. Do you see this as uh, something, given the Me Too movement and its you know, overwhelming response as a positive movement that could actually happen since it failed back in the 1970s? And what do you think would be necessary to make the conditions different um, so that we could see it actually passed? I think, I think you can use this oh, one right here. We have one. Yeah. Is it on? OK. Yeah. An excellent question, and that's right. There has been uh, debate in the feminist movement about whether to bring ERA back and to put energy into that or to pour it into other efforts. And, you know, I, I am very intrigued with that. I think that could be an inter interesting model, but I would caution that w one thing that happened as the result of um, the degradation that I described is that there was a uh, the way that the feminist movement ended up developing into the 80s, into the 90s, et cetera, was heavily legally based. It's like we're gonna move, we're gonna win because we're gonna change law. We're going to, um, you know, uh, the 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 single person bringing a suit or even a, a collective suit. That's how we get change done. That is not what the feminists of the 1970s understood. They understood that collective action builds power through organization. And sometimes you use the law, right? But sometimes you use shaming. Sometimes you use, we get, get together because we give each other strength, right? And consciousness raising sessions. And so um, I think that, that I'm a little bit in the camp of a, a little worried that we're going to throw all our eggs back into maybe that basket because what so is so exciting to me is the level of grassroots interest that we have uh, brilliant people here documenting uh, and but what this movement has not done yet is make that step to build lasting organizational change uh, and 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 part of the reason it hasn't done that is because uh, a lot of that was labor-based, and it got crushed. Yeah, back in the way. Sorry. Can I just say one really quick thing, which is, um, I think the and I want to sort of defer to Nan Hunter here. People who study social movements and think about social movements start from the premise that it it has to be multi-pronged strategies, right? That those movements are created because many th things are happening on different fronts at the same time and those strategy they start out as a strategy that's multifaceted and um, law can only be one piece of that yeah. hi um, Alicia from the security studies program um, how would you try to include cultural relativism within those studies given that there has been a lot of backlash internationally on Me Too movements in France, which we would expect them to fall into the movement. A lot of prominent mo women said that uh, the Me Too movement was ridiculous and they started creating their own movement, I'm with you, and um, the perception of uh, gender degradation differs from country to country. So is there an objective truth or is there <laughs> a, uh, from a, from a different perspective, and is there a possibility to unite the movements or discussion, collaboration internationally? <laughs> huh? Um, it's obviously a great question. I, I, I think that, uh, I don't know the answer to the question. I think that is a problem. And I think, I guess, from my most feminist, cynical point of view, my response to that would be that's the uh, insinuation of the patriarchy continuing to bolster itself up to, to diminish women who are objectively being harmed. Um, but I, I, that's just my initial reaction to that uh, because I can't believe any 
any group of women in any society, in any culture, would condone victimization of women. So I'm going to pass it to Lisa because she can speak some to about how this has been evolving in a more global context and how we've seen that in the tweets. Um, but first, before I get to that, I just want to make the simple point that it is global and there's a lot of unity across different nations as well. So although some may look at it differently and say our issue is uh, evolving or manifesting differently than it is there, there's still lots of connections that are taking place as well. So I don't want to miss that point. Yeah, I, I somewhat focused in on the English tweets because that's what we are used to thinking about. But uh, this really is a global movement. Um, there are, um, it's represented um, by um, uh, over a hundred different um, group, uh, international groups. That some of the largest hashtags that co-occur with the Me Too movement um, are in other languages and other scriptures. In fact, the largest ones are. Um, the movement is very prevalent in France. So for those who um, who think that it's not, it actually is very prevalent in France and in Korea and um, in India. Those are three big places where it's very prevalent. Um, the day that actually had the most negative tone through the whole um, time period in the last year was uh, when Trump went to England and the protests um, associated with him being there, people were very angry and they were, there was a huge spike in negative tone that day. So um, I really do think it's a global movement. I think it's really important to view it as a global movement and it was you know, something we didn't mention, but um, but the movement, the U.S. is only one piece of it. Okay, we've got time for one more question. Yeah. Hi, my name is Gina. I teach ethics in the security studies program. My question is, do you think we may ever get to a place where, despite the quest for justice for ongoing victims, we can eventually talk amnesty in order to pass legislation that looks forward and, and creates radical, real, enduring change for future generations, even though we may never be able to recover from the past? Can you say a little bit more about what you mean by amnesty? Um, I'll state the obvious. I, given the demographic of the legislative body in this country, we are never going to, in my opinion, we are never going to get the kind of legislation that we want in terms of protecting women and girls against harassment by the body of people who believe they are going to be accused of it. And let's face it, most of them are guilty. I mean, statistically speaking, most people are. I, mean, I was in college in the 80s, the whole Kavanaugh thing, give me a break. So, you know, if we can't get past that and get the same folks who know in their own history they have skeletons to legislate on behalf of the future, I don't see us ever getting out of this. I'll just speak quickly to that. I actually just released a report on this today, um, just looking at our the government officials, and those are legislators, our policy makers, and just given so many of them are accused of this, what does that look like? I also made the point in the report that I didn't bring up today that women did make history this midterm election that just passed. So women ran in historic numbers. They won in historic numbers. So it isn't a huge, you know, it isn't going to all happen overnight, but I think we were actually seeing lots of activity and momentum, so I'm not totally pessimistic that we won't see the changes in representation, and that also some of the many of the men who are in office who aren't guilty of these types of things, they do support the types of legislation that are needed. So both looking at men who care about these and women who who support the types of legislative reforms are, are all important. But I'm I guess a little bit more optimistic that we can change some of that over time. Yeah, I share your frustration. I think that um, <clears throat> to some extent it's really not about amnesty. I mean, we have laws that in theory prevent this behavior. It really is an enforcement problem and it was eye-opening to me to see the uh, overlay of the you know, highest paid, high status positions dominated by men as the same as the, uh, the chart showing, I think it was Jamila, no, who showed the chart of the bulk of the tweets are about that involve people in those positions so it's the same group of people 
Um, really, for me, I think it's it's about exposure, and it's about, I mean, as I said, it's about exposing the harm that's being done, because I think it's invisible. Can I just say one, like, tiny 15-second response to that? Um, just to go back to the cultural, I think we are all part of the future that we want to exist tomorrow and and next month and next year. And partly it means being willing to say you're a feminist, whether you're a man or a woman or neither. Say you're a feminist, think about what that means, live what it means, teach your kids what that means. I think that I really do believe in cultural change. And I think, again, going back to social movements, cultural change happens from the inside out and the outside in at the same time. OK. Thanks so much to the panel and to all of you. Those were great questions. We have a 15-minute break, and then we're back for a panel on uh, intersectionality. Thank you.